Hello, my name is Professor Sharon Peacock. I'm Professor of Public Health and Microbiology at the University of Cambridge, and I'm also the Director of the COVID-19 Genomics UK Consortium. So I'm going to be talking today about the emergence, spread and implications of SARS-CoV-2 variants. Now this slide shows the front of the COG UK website, uh, which has a daily count of how many genomes we've sequenced and to date you'll see that we sequenced more than 477,000. Now I'll start off by talking about the emergence of variants. A short primer on uh, mutations and variants. So in this slide, you'll see at the top a schematic of the entire genome of SARS-CoV-2. Now, this is a, a, an RNA genome, and it's around 30,000 bases in length. But the area that we're particularly focused on at the moment is the gene encoding the spike protein. Now, this sits around the, uh, decorates the outside of the virus, and is particularly important in, in uh, attaching to the human ACE2 receptor and in uptake into human cells. So a critical point and one which uh, vaccines are targeted against uh, together with antibodies. Now, uh, mutations uh, occurring uh, at random along the genome uh, occur at around one to two times a month. Uh, these are completely random and Mutations may lead to no effect on the virus biology at all, so there's no apparent change. Now, some mutations may by chance lead to a disadvantage to the virus, and in that case, they may not be observed or may become extinguished. But the ones we really worry about are those that could lead to an advantage to the virus uh, so that the virus is fitter and leads to an expansion of that virus in the human population. Now, the term variant is used to describe the entire uh, genome of, of a particular virus, including all of its mutations, and a mutation is a change at a single point in the genome. Now, when are variants important? Well, there are four categories that we're particularly concerned about. The first is when variants have higher transmissibility or replication. Uh, the second is when they are able to escape from vaccines or therapeutics or from natural immunity built up from uh, natural infection. We worry about variants that could lead to higher disease severity and also those that impact on diagnostic testing. So what about the terminology and the escalation of variants? Well, we're, we're looking out for variants um, all the time uh, and that is somewhat like looking for a needle in a haystack because going back to what I said earlier, mutations and variants are arising all the time. But horizon scanning occurs every day to look for variants of, of, of interest. Now, they may be variants that have mutations that we have seen before associated with particular biological characteristics, such as increased transmissibility or immune escape. Variants of interest are those where there's genetic evidence that the variant may be of interest in terms of its biology, but there isn't the science to back that up. There isn't the definite proof of cause and effect. So seeing a mutation or a particular genetic variant is not proof in and of itself to say that something will behave in a particular way. So experiments need to be done both uh, in the laboratory and also looking at the uh, modeling and epidemiology of uh, that particular variant spread. And if there is a cause and effect proof for increased transmission and or immune evasion, then that variant is termed a variant of concern and that's important uh, because that is then uh, 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 goes under stricter surveillance uh, and uh, further examination such as for te surge testing. Now the highest um, uh, category of variants are a variant of high consequence. We haven't observed one of those to date and these are variants that are of particular concern because the amount of transmissibility or the amount of uh, immune evasion uh, that they may have and so clearly something that we'd be concerned about, but not something uh, for today. 
Now, when we're thinking about variants, it's important to consider what drives them, in particular, if we're trying to drive down variants of concern emerging. The first area where variants of concern are likely to arise is when we have uncontrolled viral transmission and COVID-19 infection. The, the fact is that if we had no transmission and no disease, then no variants would emerge because they will only emerge when the virus is replicating in the affected host. So we see variants of concern emerging when there's a high amount of viral transmission between individuals. Now, variants with a fitness advantage, uh, in particular with immune evasion, uh, have uh, the possibility of arising when transmission is occurring between people that already have partial immunity. Under these circumstances, uh, the fittest virus will be one that can actually find a chink in our immune protection. We've also observed that people with uh, uh, immunocompromised compromise who can be infected for a very long period of time and cannot clear the virus represent effectively a training ground for the virus. So the virus can actually change quite significantly. And during that period of time, um, uh, the virus is adapting to get to avoid the host immune system and also avoid a drugs that the patient may be given. And in fact, it may have been the case that, that the Kent variant B117 arose under such circumstances. And finally, we mustn't forget that human to animal passage is really important because the virus may change uh, quite considerably when it, it moves from human to animal uh, uh, to an animal, where it becomes adapted um, to uh, animal persistence. And when it comes back to the human again, the genetics may have changed to the point where we may end up with a, a virus with changed biological characteristics. But actually, one of the key uh, factors in controlling uh, uh, the pandemic at the moment is to think about spread of variants. And what I'd like to do now is briefly touch on some evidence looking at the introduction of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus into uh, the United Kingdom during uh, the first wave going back to March and April of 2020. And this helps us to understand the, the role of travel and introductions in, in the pandemic an infection in a given country. So in this, this work uh, that I'm showing you here, uh, uh, Louis de, de Plessis looked at the origins of introduction and importation intensity into the United Kingdom, uh, starting from the very beginning of the pandemic uh, uh, through, to, uh, through to June. So uh, they uh, collected the SARS-CoV-2 genomes in Gizade on the 23rd of June, 2020. That's all of the genomes that were available plus all of the genomes that have been sequenced by COG UK on the 26th of June. And you can see there the final data set was over 50,000 genomes sampled between uh, December uh, 2019 and June 2020. Now in the graph there, you'll see the frequency of genomes per day that we included in the study uh, with the colors showing uh, introductions into England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And then in the gray, other cases. So you can see that they accumulated up until around uh, end of March and early April, and then began to decline as we went into lockdown. Now, this study uh, showed that there were more than 1,000 identifiable independent UK transmission lineages up to the end of April 2020. That's likely to be a substantial um, under-recognition of introductions during that period. Now, at the time, we were particularly worried about the introduction of SARS-CoV-2 from China, but what you'll see from the graph, uh, the China isolates were in brown, there was a small signal at the very beginning of the uh, uh, pandemic in the UK, but actually, over time, the rate and source of introduction changed substantially and rapidly throughout time. So the rate peaked in mid-March, and most introductions occurred during March, and actually, a third of those were from inbound travel from Spain, around a third from France and 12% from Italy. So overall, there were very few introductions from Southeast Asia and 80% of importations occurred up until the point of 30th of March. What this suggests is that um, uh, uh, the pandemic was a European pandemic in, 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 in our particular region of the world. Um, and so uh, one has to think very carefully about where other countries have particularly high burdens of infection um, uh, and relay that to your uh, border uh, policy. But I really want to get on in particular to implications of, of the variants that do arise. 
Now, this is actually a very complicated uh, a piece of, of work following the variance of concern and interest. Um, this is a screenshot of the global variance of concern and variance of interest as of the 11th of May, as based on the uh, WHO epi epidemiological update. You'll see at the top that there are four global variants of concern at the moment, and I'll be talking briefly about about two of those before I go on to discuss in more detail the variant first detected in India, which I think is very relevant at the moment. And then there are variants of interest, uh, which uh, can be added over time, but also taken away over time if those variants actually become extinct um, uh, um, on observation. Now, first of all, let's talk about lineage B117, sometimes referred to as the Kent variant. It was first detected in the south of England, and the earliest genome we know about was from the 20th of September 2020. It's been, now been reported in 137 countries, um, and it's highly prevalent in many of those countries. Now, there's a notable uh, mutation or amino acid substitution referred to as N501Y, which occurs in the uh, spike uh, protein, uh, which actually re represents an as uh, asparagine to tyrosine replacement. Now, this sits in the receptor binding motif of spike and increases binding affinity to uh, human ACE2 receptor. Now, the, the uh, percentage of increased transmissibility for this variant actually varies between studies, but it ranges between 43 and 90 percent. Now, it's considered to have increased risk of hospitalization, i.e. disease severity. So more people go into hospital with infection, but once in hospital, uh, uh, there aren't more deaths with this particular variant compared with previous. So it appears to cause uh, more severe disease, uh, but not more severe uh, deaths. Now, this particular variant um, is, uh, affects a diagnostic test called uh, the, uh, the S-gene. It's referred to as S-gene target failure in the TACPATH assay. And what that means is that this particular test uh, targets several uh, points in the genome, but the S-gene fails. And that doesn't mean that the test is false negative, but it's actually a very useful, useful surrogate marker for tracking this particular variant over time. Fortunately, uh, vaccine uh, impact has not been significant, uh, which is very fortunate because this variant is uh, most prevalent in the country at around over 80% at the moment. I want to touch briefly on lineage B1351, uh, first detected in South Africa. Uh, the earliest genome is October 2020, around the same time as the as 117. This again has uh, uh, had a passport to travel. It's reported in 84 different countries. It's considered to be uh, more transmissible. Uh, there was an increased risk of in-hospital -hosp mortality during the second wave in South Africa, uh, but uh, neutralization, the key is that neutralization is substantially decreased. What that means is that when uh, the virus is mixed with antibodies uh, from people with either natural infection or those induced by uh, a vaccine, the ability to neutralize the virus and prevent it from attaching and take, being taken up into cells is dramatically or well, markedly reduced. However, the vaccine impact um, is uh, uh, not uh, as, uh, as substantial. And I think the good news from a recent study from Qatar where there's a mixture of infections between B117 and B1351 has demonstrated um, that the Pfizer vaccine can reduce severe disease or death uh, by 97.4% and actually reduce infection by 75%. And so the, the clinical uh, uh, real world evidence suggests that vaccines continue to work uh, for this particular variant. Uh, it was of concern to see a smaller study of the AZ uh, two-dose regimen vaccine in South Africa not appearing to show protection against mild to moderate disease. Uh, that was uh, uh, an inconclusive study because of its size. And so at the moment, uh, the current evidence suggests that uh, vaccination has efficacy against this particular lineage. Now, what I really want to focus on in the rest of my talk is the very latest, what's next in uh, the United Kingdom. What you'll see here is a, a screen grab from uh, the uh, COVID-19 Sanger website, which shows a dynamic uh, picture of the circulating variants based on genome sequencing, um, and in particular gives data for the two weeks uh, to 8th of May 2021. 
Now at the top, you see genomes per week, and in the bottom, you see the proportion of genomes per week at any given week. And the colors show that the green is a B lineage, um, uh, the uh, pink is a lineage that was introduced from Europe uh, some while ago, B1177, which became a, a, a very uncommon uh, by February. And then you see the B117 variant, which actually became completely dominant in, in the country uh, uh, through December into January and through to May. However, what you will see in the top right hand corner of this uh, particular uh, proportion is something appearing here in the green. And looking at the guide here, you'll see that this is the B1617.2 variant uh, first detected in India, which at this point in time uh, from these data uh, constitutes 20% of the uh, infections occurring in the UK. So the rest of my talk is going to be focused on this to try and understand what is happening with this variant at the moment. Now, if we pause for a moment and we take a look at the data in India, what this graph shows um, is the case prevalence of specific variants over time in India based on Gizaid data. Now, Gizaid is the global database that contains a genome sequencing data, but there are important caveats to the interpretation of this and that is that there are relatively small amounts of genome uh, deposited from India over time. And I'm not certain of where the samples were isolated from and whether this represents fully random sampling or whether it represents geographical uh, sampling. But what we see from this graph, if we look at the blue line, we see that the B117, which is transmissible, has actually appeared to have a, a uh, become relatively common uh, in April, but has now actually declined significantly. Now, if we look at the green line, B1617.1, uh, this is one of three variants of the uh, 617 lineage. And this was particularly common uh, during April and has now declined. What you'll see here in the orange is that the 0.2 version is actually, uh, based on these figures, extremely common uh, and constitutes, at least on these figures, around 75% of all genomes uh, at the moment deposited in India. Now, if we look at the UK data and look at cases with recent travel coming back into the country from India, you'll see here from a PHE technical briefing, this graph shows the number of cases over time. If we look here at the um, uh, B117, the UK variant, you can see that cases did actually have this variant over time, but that's declined over time up until the 25th of April, consistent with the India Gizade data. You'll see that the 0.1 variant of 617 is really uh, relatively static, but what you'll see in the light blue is that the 0.2 variant of 617 is actually rising uh, considerably over time. So this recent travel history from India is consistent with the GIZAID data that we've seen. I've not shown the third um, sub-lineage of, of, um, of 617 uh, because it's actually rather uncommon and uh, does not appear to be uh, spreading in particular. Now, if we then turn to the genomic epidemiology of the 617.2 variant um, in England on the left, You'll see the data from uh, uh, the Sanger. This is what's called pillar two sequencing. And pillar two is the sequencing from community testing and the mega, mega uh, laboratories or the lighthouse laboratories. And the point I want to make here is that, that already the 0.2 version of 617 is actually widely distributed across the country. Although there are particular hotspots and we've already heard it in the news at where these are, including Bolton and London. Now on the right hand side is a figure from uh, the technical briefing from PHE, and it shows the cumulative cases in England of variants uh, um, over time. And so you'll see uh, uh, days since specimen date of first reported case. And the dark green line here is the 0.2 variant of 617. And what you'll see is that the slope of the curve for cumulative cases is much steeper than others, including, for example, 
the B1351 variant first detected in South Africa, which is in the dark blue. So together, these two slides indicate that this, the, the 0.2 version of 617 is already widely distributed in the country and cumulative cases are rising uh, more rapidly than other variants. Now in this slide, what this shows, and this is uh, the percentage of sequence cases and not all cases, um, over time uh, showing between February and May, uh, and in the bottom figure here, you see the variants actually isolated from travellers. And you'll see in the purple, this is the 0.2 vari variant version of 617. And you'll see that it was actually increasingly common in people coming back to the country from April onwards. But actually, there's been a conversion so that actually transmission is now occurring in the community. So the top is um, not associated with travel. Uh, for this is in particular uh, uh, var variants of, of interest or variants of concern. So you'll see in particular that the 0.2 version is now spreading in the community. Now, I mentioned that B117 is, has an S gene target failure in the TAC path assay, which is used in uh, Lighthouse Labs. And the uh, 617.2 version is S gene positive. So what these can be used for is a surrogate, and not a completely accurate surrogate, but a surrogate marker for the transition between 117 and other variants of interest or concern that are largely S gene positive. It's, it's largely, at the moment, only 117 that is S gene negative. That's not an absolute, uh, but it's rough approximation. So again, this is from the PHE technical briefing. And at the top here, you'll see uh, the uh, count um, of isolates that are either S gene uh, 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 negative, which is in the green, and you can see here that uh, most, well, all ice, nearly all isolates are S gene negative um, uh, uh, initially, and then looking at S gene positive, and what you'll see really uh, that the in the purple, the number of S gene positive um, isolates are were beginning to go up over time, uh, suggesting that there's replacement of the 117 lineage. And if we look at the bottom uh, graph here, you can actually see in more detail from March uh, to May onwards, then cases with a detectable S gene is beginning to increase and is now around 38%. Now, not all of those isolates are sequenced, but if we, sequ if we look at the sequencing for um, S gene positive, more than 90% are currently the 617.2 variant. Now, this provides a more granular uh, image of what is happening around the country. And what you'll see is that purported 617.2, or at least S gene positive uh, uh, variants that are causing infection in the country, have a marked geographical variation. So, for example, in the Northwest, the S gene positive uh, variants are a more common cause of disease now than, than S gene negative, which is assumed to be 117. This is not the case everywhere, but certainly in several regions of the country, um, this is the case. And so this is all consistent with uh, the 617.2 variant becoming widespread and actually uh, replacing uh, the 117 variant. Now, this is a, a, a graph that's shown from the uh, SPIM consensus statement, which is in the public domain uh, on the 12th of May 2021. And what this is looking at is the da daily growth rate of the 617.2 variant in areas with known clusters. Now, the, uh, the orange uh, line is S gene and negative, which we assume is 117. Uh, the green line is uh, S gene positive, which we assume is largely 617.2. And what you're seeing here in this graph is the doubling time of those two uh, uh, variants or lineages over time. And what this is showing is that actually uh, the doubling time of 117 is a flat or declining, but the doubling time of the 617.2 variant is increasing very quickly. So that uh, is, is indicative of a, a, a significant growth advantage of 617.2 over the 117. And uh, the, 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 the SPIM report suggested that the 0.2 version had a transmission advantage of more than 
over the current circulating lineage. Now, what does that mean in terms of, uh, of if 617.2 is spreading in the country, uh, what does it mean? At the moment, it appears to be more transmissible. There is no evidence at the moment that it has uh, immune evasion. And so this is modeling done by Warwick University, again in the public domain, in which it, it's, com it's, it's comparing the potential epidemic trajectories for an undefined variant of concern with different levels of increased transmissibility compared with B117. And this does assume that the variant has no immune escape. And what this shows is <clears throat> graphs of uh, the number of cases over time uh, through step two, which is uh, this uh, figure on the top left, <clears throat> step three on the, <clears throat> excuse me, on the right, and step four in the bottom. And we'll be familiar with these steps in the UK, um, but if you're interested, uh, what these steps mean are on the right. And we've just moved from step two um, to step three. What you'll see here is that uh, the potential uh, for increased cases is quite significant as we go into step three, uh, with a peak if something is 50% more transmissible of uh, 14,000 cases going into hospital uh, to a peak of in August. Um, and of course that rate drops as the uh, proportion of transmissibility goes down. And so that if this uh, variant is only 10% more transmissible uh, compared with 117, the, uh, the line, uh, the increase in cases over the summer is relatively uh, low. What this means is that all eyes are on uh, the accuracy of the prediction of transmissibility. At the moment, it is considered to be more transmissible, but more data is really required to understand how transmissible. And then uh, going forward uh, in a, on a kind of week by week basis to carefully watch uh, the, uh, whether there's an increase in cases. This will also uh, very much be influenced by the degree of vaccination in the population and the immunity in the population. And so my last slide is to really stress the importance of sequencing as a tool to provide actionable information. It will detect variants of concern and, and in the future, potentially variants of high consequence as soon as possible. And it's gonna be doing this to keep diagnostics, vaccines and therapeutics working for us. We'll also be, need, need to be using sequencing to understand the geographical distribution of variants of concern and high consequence. And in particular, variants actually um, that are highly transmissible uh, rapidly spread across uh, the world. And we need to be uh, clear that if we have a variant that's more transmissible, we need to understand uh, where that is spreading and the implications for that uh, in the population. So finally, uh, this work, uh, all of the work, the sequencing that's done in the, the United Kingdom is through the effort of hundreds of people in the COVID-19 Genomics UK Consortium. And I would like to thank them very much. This slide is the most important one. Uh, to uh, uh, really acknowledge the contribution that their work is having in terms of pandemic control in the United Kingdom. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's um, my great pleasure to be able to introduce Professor Peacock uh, in person now. Uh, you've listened to her most enjoyable talk online uh, that was recorded a little while ago. Um, and it's um, my duty to put your questions to her. So do feel free to put your questions in the chat um, in the chat box. Um, but I'll, I'll take the uh, chairman's uh, precedent, if you like, of asking the first question. And uh, I think uh, it's quite clear that your um, predictions have turned out to be absolutely right. Um, but there may be a little bit of confusion in people's minds with the way the nomenclature has moved on. Would, would you like to elaborate mm -hmm. on that a little bit for people since your talk was recorded? Yes, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to to both uh, uh, record that talk and be here today. It's, it's um, a great opportunity to speak about variants. Um, so when I recorded the talk, uh, the WHO had not uh, released their information about how we were going to rename variants. And I'm very glad that they have, have um, uh, come to a decision to rename them. Um, it was important for us to be able to do that because the, the nomenclature is quite confusing. Uh, there are several different systems for naming variants and um, they're not very memorable. So uh, B1.617.2 is not the sort of thing you tend to remember unless you're working on it every single day. 
And so um, uh, I think it's a, a great thing that WHO have brought in uh, uh, the uh, the Greek uh, letters of the alphabet to be able to name the, the major ver- global variants of concern and those of interest. And so now uh, the 117 that first arose in Kent, we refer to as the alpha variant and uh, the variant first emerging from India is now the Delta variant. And that's not only easy for us to remember once we get used to it, but it also avoids the potential stigmatization. And so, you know, when the UK variant first, uh, you know, the variant first emerging in Kent was first detected, um, people were calling it kind of the British variant or the, or the uh, you know, the Kent variant. And, and you know, it's, it's easy to slip into that. But what one has to realise is it can be stigmatising. Uh, most countries in the world will have their own unique variants um, and uh, variants and viral evolution doesn't respect any borders. And so this is going to happen mm-hmm. everywhere. And so for the WHO to come up with this and release it, I think has been really helpful. So apologies if um, I haven't used the late, latest nomenclature. Not at all. It's quite understandable, given when the re- when the recording was made. Mm. Do you think that there are enough there are enough letters in the Greek alphabet? Are we not are we in danger of running out, or is is it? It doesn't seem to be going too quickly at the moment. Um, well, if we if we reserve it for a specific uh, variants of concern or interest, I hope that we'll have uh, some mileage yet. I think one of the things that 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 uh, myself and colleagues are already talking about is if you have um, a variant, say the alpha variant, which then actually goes on to evolve further. Uh, itself and and in fact the alpha variant is evolving further so it's it's acquiring new mutations that we know could be associated with immune escape for example the e484k mutation so called actually what do you call that so we have an nomenclature for uh, a variant of concern but as those variants of concern evolve further and actually acquire new characteristics uh, then i think that that once again the nomenclature gets quite quite difficult so I'm looking forward again to see how how we're going to handle that in a way that's user friendly. Mm-hmm. Yes, you, you you touch on the uh, on the on the question of immune escape there as well, which uh, mm. um, I found for, I found your talk quite um, a pint half full, glass half full, in the sense that actually the vaccines seem to be working very well. Mm-hmm. Presumably, this is down to the fact the vaccines elicit very good. Um, antibody responses, uh, polyclonal mm-hmm. antibody responses. How concerned do you think we have to be about the, the, the position of uh, mm. uh, immune escape in, in, in this? Well, uh, I have to say that I am a pint, pint half half full of sort of person, so I'm generally optimistic. Um, and I, when I first observed the uh, uh, the experimental data on. Uh, the variant the first detected in South Africa. Um, I was quite concerned about that because the neutralization levels were, were actually dropped, you know, they, they were very low, and that was of concern. And then there was a, a, a trial, a small trial in South Africa uh, with the AZ vaccine, suggesting that efficacy was not going to be that high. But since then, there's been new data, uh, particularly a study in Qatar that looked at um, efficacy of, of vaccines against various variants. And that's been much more encouraging. So I would say if there's any if there's any sense that it's a, I'm pessimistic, I'm definitely optimistic that at the moment the vaccines work for all of the variants of concern that at least we know about. And I'm also optimistic about the fact that as new variants emerge, that because we're, we're seeking them out, we're investigating them very quickly, and we have the ability to change vaccines quickly, that we will be able to stay ahead of the curve. And so there are variants of concern that, you know, are, are of concern. But at the moment, I think we all need to get vaccinated and vaccines are working very well indeed. So it's a bit more than, than pint half half full. It's it's about, it's about 80% full at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, I, I feel, personally, I feel quite positive about the mm. way things are. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, I think earlier in your talk, you mentioned that the Kent, I'll call it the Kent variant. Alpha. <laughs> Alpha. Um, arose, maybe may have arisen as a result of treatment. Did I, or did I miss well, cer- Certainly, no, certainly um, uh, one hypothesis is that that arose in somebody who had chronic infection, an immunocompromised person. Oh, right. uh, and, and so, so you know, there there are various ways that, uh, that, that variants are selected for. Um, they're just, it's just survival of the fittest or kind of selection of the fittest, if you like. And, very high rates of transmission in partially immune populations is an important point there. 
But mm. there's a hypothesis that uh, that the alpha variant arose in somebody with the immunocompromised, and really just the fact that this is a training ground for the virus to persist in somebody for uh, you know well the longest I think is just short of a year. So the virus has the opportunity to adapt or at least be selected for in terms of specific, if a mutation arises, it could be selected for for a kind of um, a better interaction from its perspective in the human host. And so uh, the, the, the hypothesis is supported by case reports um, of patients who've been given, uh, for example, convalescent plasma, which has been followed by a, um, um, an array of different uh, variants emerging uh, with different mutations. And so there's sort of circumstantial evidence, if you like, but we, we were very unlikely to ever find the index uh, case of, of the alpha variant. And so it is speculation, but as I say, there's some supportive uh, uh, case study evidence for that at the moment. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, just checking the questions coming in. There haven't been any more questions so far. Um, one of the key things that strikes me with uh, as some as somebody who's done a lot of sequencing work myself is also this the, the and, you, and you allude to this early in your talk um the importance of relating the genotype to the phenotype so you're, you're mm -hmm. looking at increasing transmission or vaccine escape as possible phenotypes um how, how do you feel about the assays that are used and and, and how supportive they are to, to to analyzing the the data here mm. Well, we, we, I guess the sequence data is at the very start of the journey, which we are suggesting, and getting it pushed through to, uh, you know, the laboratory assays and also uh, the epidemiological studies that we need to do, for example, to demonstrate whether something is more transmissible or not. Um, all of those pipelines are very connected uh, up in, in, in the UK. So the Genotype to Phenotype Consortium, for example, uh, and Public Health England are very active in, in looking at... at, um, at, at, at outbreaks and cases over time so i think that that works as well as it possibly can do but the 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 the, the kind of the fact is that even with everything working at, at full pelts it can actually take months to really even reach a conclusion about about uh transmissibility so i think the delta variant that we're that we're facing now you know we first saw the delta variant in the uk kind of in mid-march and we're still you know, debating um, how more, how much more transmissible it is than the alpha variant. And so, those that connectivity between sequence through to uh, phenotype and through to uh, uh, real world data is really really important. But we have to be um, uh, mindful of actually how long it takes. Mm -hmm. I think a very good example is is the first uh, mutation that, uh, that appeared to be of significance, D614G, which made the virus more transmissible and that emerged very early on perhaps march april 2020 it's taken a full year to really understand to start to dig down into the biology of why it's more transmissible so um it's it's quite frustrating that it can take so long to say that a variant is you know x percent more transmissible than y uh, but these studies do take um a while and what's interesting about the pandemic is that with with scientific uh, work We'll often take years to refine our, our thinking, refine our data, write it very carefully, then go through peer review. It can take years. But what we're doing here is we're seeing scientists think and articulate what they think every day. And sometimes that kind of changes as well. So this whole area of when do you expect an answer? And is that exam answer going to be a single answer? So that's a slightly expanded sort of discussion about what we're doing at the moment. But I think that um, everything's connected together, but it takes a certain amount of time to get the accurate answers out to people. Hmm. I mean, I think I think there's a, a big uh, there's a reflection here of how much the as we were discussing before the session started, how, how the sequencing technology has moved on massively, hmm. um, but some of the other biological assays and methods methodologies are, are still much slower to to hmm. keep up. I guess, hmm. yeah. That's that's very interesting. Thank you. Um, I'll just check that whether the um, there's a couple of questions uh, come in. Um, do you think poor vaccine rollout could cause uh, could uh, aid the selection of variants and, and drive the selection of variants that mm. avoid immunity better? Yeah, this is something that's much discussed. And if you have a partially immune population, then uh, there's a certain inevitability that that could actually um, 
uh, select for variants that have uh, immune escape. Um, despite that, we're actually seeing, as you mentioned previously, we're seeing uh, a very limited number of variants that are arising with that property, and we're still able to vaccinate against uh, those variants. But it has to be it has to be the case that if you if you uh, impose a, a selection criteria against a pathogen, be it a virus or a bacterium, then that will be a driver for evolution uh, in the direction of trying to evade. Uh, uh, you know, that particular, uh, uh, you know, characteristic vaccine or even like antibiotic resistance, you use an antibiotic and you you uh, uh, you see emer- uh, resistance emerging. So I think it has to be the case that that will um, uh, drive the emergence of, of immune escape variants. Thank you. Um, another question here is, and I think that this sort of speaks to something we were talking about before as well, before the session started, is the, it is how can we help roll out sequencing to ensure that it, it can happen more globally and there's good coverage in, in poorer areas and rural areas? And, and I think, uh, as you pointed out to me earlier, this also includes data analysis. It's not just mm-hmm. achieving the sequencing. Mm, yeah. I mean, it, it, um, it's true that, that uh, you know, we're very privileged in many ways in, the con- in this country to have sequencing, but many other countries don't. And and that's really problematic if they if they don't know the circulating variant because you need that information to really understand your vaccine uh, uh, strategy in the future. Perhaps not now, but 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 later on down the line. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do we get to that? I think it's not just one simple answer. I think that there needs to be uh, um, uh, a strong sort of top down strategy for how we link data, how we uh, support countries both uh, financially and in terms of of of, of training. Training is critical to this, but you need the training, you need the, the equipment, you need, you know, obviously you need the funding, and then you need somewhere to analyze your data and actually, you know, share your data with other people so you can work out um, uh, more of a collective uh, uh, picture of what's happening in your country. So I think that's going to take a, a sort of top down strategy and funding strategy, but also bottom up. So I think it's incumbent on, on people who have the expertise uh, to be willing to teach. Um, certainly in COG UK, we're developed, we've just received a, a, an award to start to develop online courses and train the trainer courses and virtual classrooms. And so I think that there's going to have to be both directions of support um, so that we can get a, a better uh, a, a better kind of uh, system that's that's more widely distributed across the across the world. Together with vaccines, of course, we need the quality of both vaccines and sequencing technology. Yeah. Um, so the vaccines is the COVAX program, isn't it? But uh, yes. there's not a counterpart that I know of, apart from what you've just told us about for, for sequencing. Yes. No, no, and and, I, and we do need a, a, an equivalent of COVAX really for sequencing because in the long in the longer term, we really are going to know need to know the the variants that are circ- circulating. Uh, I mean, if you if you think about the influenza program, for example, understanding the circulating uh, influenza virus at any given time is key to choosing the vaccination that you roll out in the, in the world. And that's going to have to be the model that we move towards. And that's when sequencing of the virus um, uh, with, with a kind of unbiased sequencing around the world is going to be so important uh, to make those sorts of decisions. Well, thank you very much for your taking the time to talk to us today. And, and the, the, the time it takes to record lectures is uh, um, also a serious imposition on someone's time so thank you very much for uh, for all the time you've taken and, and for this informative discussion um and hopefully we'll meet up in person at some point at a meeting somewhere <laughs> i very much hope so well thank you very much for inviting me as i say it's been an absolute pleasure uh, and and thank you for uh, speaking today with me absolutely thank, yeah. you. thank you very much all right bye-bye bye bye then bye bye Thank you.